Now it's time to talk about post-processing your images, and with that, we're going to discuss a few different things. What is post-processing? What are some of the ethics involved? What can and can't you do when you're editing your images? And what software options are available for you? So what is post-processing? Well, you might have heard the term editing your images or editing your photos before, and that means the exact same thing, and that is simply the process of adjusting and manipulating your photos. Now, it could be something as simple as tweaking the exposure just a little bit, or as complicated as completely replacing the sky in a scene. All of those fall under the umbrella of post-processing or editing your images. Now, I just mentioned replacing the sky in an image, and that brings up the point of ethics in photography and photo editing. Now, this varies from genre to genre, but there's one genre where it is never acceptable to alter an image after it's been taken, and that is in documentary and reportage types of photography. In a war photograph, in journalism, in any of these types where you're recording what is actually going on, you cannot alter those images. You can't go in and remove something from the scene or add something to the scene because that is creating a situation that never existed. That is altering the facts and that is simply not acceptable in reporting or journalism type of photography. Now, in portrait photography, it's gonna be completely different. Say you have someone who has a blemish on their cheek. You take their picture, that blemish isn't gonna be there next week or next month or next year. So is it acceptable to remove it? Yes, it's totally acceptable to remove that blemish, make that person look their best. But there is kind of a fine line where this is concerned. You don't want to cross the line and start removing permanent features from that person. You don't want to remove moles or freckles or scars. Things like that change who a person is and what they really look like. So you have to be careful in how far you go in editing your photos when people are concerned. In fashion photography, photo editing kind of gets pushed to the extreme. You've heard the term Photoshop before, and that used to just refer to the actual software, Adobe Photoshop. But now it's an accepted term that means you've adjusted and altered an image beyond reality. It's something that has ceased to be real and is now in the realm of perfection. And it makes sense because these people who are paying all this money for these advertising campaigns, they want the celebrities or the models or whoever or whatever is in the image to look perfect. But what is it doing to the people viewing these images? They think that these celebrities and models are perfect when in reality they aren't. And they're striving and they're even hurting themselves in order to reach that level of perfection. And it's just not really possible. So for these reasons, Nassim and I don't think that this level of photo editing is acceptable. It is not something that's ethical and should be done. And there's even movements in the fashion industry to move away from this level of heavy photo manipulation. But if you photograph people, it's up to you to decide just how much is gonna be too much photo editing. Are you gonna be okay with removing skin blemishes or cleaning up a few stray hairs? Yeah, sure. What about smoothing out someone's skin so they look a few years younger? Yeah, probably. What about making someone look a lot skinnier or making someone's arms or chest look a lot bigger than they really are? In my opinion, that's crossing the line and is unethical photo editing. So make sure at the end of the day that your subjects look like they do in reality and they don't look like someone else. So let's talk about landscape photography. Earlier, I mentioned replacing the sky in an image. Now, is this something that's ever acceptable? Let's look at an example. Say you're a landscape photographer and you go out to this beautiful area, but the weather doesn't cooperate. Maybe the sky is completely overcast, so you have to go back maybe 15 or 20 times before you finally get the perfect image where everything works and the scene is just beautiful. Well, maybe there was a photographer who went out that first time and said, well, you know, I'll just go ahead and take a picture of this. I'll go home, hop in Photoshop. I've got a pretty sky from another day. I'll just throw that in here and eh, perfect. That's good. Is that ethical? If they're trying to pass it off as something that they actually photographed, no, it is completely unethical because they're lying to their viewer. They're trying to pass it off as something that existed and that is just not right. Now, on the other hand, if they say, well, this is a composite. If, I, if they let the viewer know, I took the sky from this image and the landscape from this image and put them together to make this pretty picture you see here, eh, there's nothing wrong with that but there's something else at play here. When viewers look at an image, they assume it's real. They think that whatever they're looking at actually happened. So it's a really fine line these photographers take when they composite images together because the viewer automatically assumes it's real. 
So if they are taking measures by stating that this image is a composite right in the title, then ethically they're fine. They're not trying to mislead the viewer and they're just telling them, you know, I'm expressing my artistic freedom here. I'm creating an image that's pleasing to me and hopefully is to you as well. If on the other hand, they try and pass it off as something that happened when it never did, that is completely unethical and they're just flat out lying. So why do we need to edit images in the first place? Well, the simplest reason is just to make them look better. Images that come from your camera rarely look the way the scene originally did, so it takes a little bit of work on your part just to make them look good. Now, while you're editing images, you're able to incorporate your own vision into the images, and that's your own artistic license. Now, if two people are cooking and they're given the exact same raw ingredients and they're told to prepare the same dish, what are the chances that the final dish they both prepare is gonna taste and look the same? Pretty much impossible. They both come in with their own interpretation of what that final dish is supposed to taste and look like. And that's based on their previous personal experience. It's the same with editing an image. If two people are given the same file to edit, the chances of them producing identical results are very, very low. Take a look at these two images that Nassim and I edited. Now, even though we both started with the same raw file, you can see the images look fairly different. And why is that? Well, he has a different idea of how the final image should look than I do, so we go through the editing process differently. I might like a more subtle look, he might look a little more vibrant look in his, but in the end, we both produce images that we're happy with, and that's what's the most important part about editing images, is that you're happy with the final result. You should edit images in your vision, use your own artistry, and create something that you're happy with. There are some photographers out there who don't believe in photo editing, and what they'll do is they'll set their cameras to shoot in JPEG mode, and whatever comes out of the camera is what they use. They don't do any additional manipulation or adjustment to those images, and they only go with what comes straight out of the camera. Now, what they might not realize is there is still editing going on. Whatever settings they chose in the camera are applied once the image is taken, and this, in effect, gives the camera control over the post-processing. Now, why would you give this simple machine control over such an important part of your images? Why wouldn't you want to sit down and spend a little bit more time personalizing the images and making them look exactly the way you want instead of just taking whatever comes out of this machine? Now, take a photographer like Ansel Adams. He produced so many iconic images and he shot on film, so does that mean he never edited any of his photos? No, of course not. He spent hours in the darkroom. In fact, he spent more time in the darkroom working on his images than he did out in the field taking them. He was a perfectionist, so he spent tons of time dodging and burning and cropping and doing all these things just to make sure his final image looked perfect. Now. If he was alive today, I would bet you money that he would be in love with all of the different editing options that we have available to us. So if you take anything from this section, please realize that editing photos is not only acceptable, but it is necessary. There is absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's always been done, and it's something that you should do to get the most out of every single image you take. So what types of images should you be editing? Well, you've heard me talk about RAW and JPEGs, and for the benefit of anyone who doesn't know what those are and who hasn't seen our Level 1 Photography Basics course where we covered this already, let's talk about it really quickly here. So a RAW file is a digital negative, and it contains a lot of information that you can use when you're editing your images. Now, going back to our cooking analogy, a RAW file is just like a pile of RAW ingredients. There's lots of potential there, and with those ingredients, you can create a lot of different dishes. It's the same with the raw file for images. You can create so many different looks for your final photo because there's so much information contained in that one file. Now a JPEG image is just like going to a Chinese restaurant and ordering a stir fried dish. All of the ingredients have already been cooked together, so you can't take them and separate them out and cook an entirely new dish with them because they're already cooked. Sure, you can change the flavor a little bit, add some soy sauce or some spice or something, but you're basically stuck with what you get. It's the same with the JPEG. Everything, all the information, and all of the settings have been cooked into the final image, and your options for adjustment are very, very limited. So this is something that we've written about on Photography Life. We've said it in previous videos, and we're gonna say it again. If you want the most flexibility, and if you want the capability to get the best images possible, shoot in RAW. Raw images give you so many options when you're editing. They give you so much latitude and flexibility, 
you'd be crazy to shoot in JPEG and expect to get the same results as you can when shooting in RAW. For an example of how powerful RAW images are and how much information they contain, take a look at this image. Now we shot two identical images, one in RAW and one in JPEG. This is the RAW that you're looking at here. The white balance is way off, but we were able to correct it and make the image look normal again. Now take a look at this JPEG image, exact same white balance as the RAW, but let's go ahead and try and correct it and see what happens. You can see we couldn't get nearly as close to a normal looking image as we could with the RAW file, and that's simply because there isn't as much information there to work with. So this should give you a good example of just how powerful RAW images are. There's lots of other examples we could give you, and we will give you later on in this video, of how flexible they can be when you're editing your images. So how do you edit your images? Well, there's lots of different software out there and they all are built to help you work with and edit your images. To start with, there's image viewing and culling software. For example, there's Fast Draw Viewer and Photo Mechanic and those are designed to help you quickly look at the images you've taken and decide which ones you want to spend more time editing. There's also raw conversion software, and this is software that you can typically get from your camera manufacturer or from a third party. And the whole purpose of this is just to convert raw images into a format that your editing software can work with. Next, there's image editing software such as Photoshop, Lightroom, Capture One, and many others. And these are all the main programs that you're gonna use to edit your photos. And lastly, there are very specialized programs out there that have very specific uses, such as lens correction, HDR, panorama stitching, and many more. Because there's so many different software options out there, we're not even gonna try to cover all of them. Instead, we're just gonna cover the ones that are the most popular and that we use on a regular basis. Now, one thing to note, if you've been using an image editing software, say Adobe Lightroom, and you buy a brand new camera, Lightroom might not support the raw files from that camera for some time. So that means either you have to wait to edit those files or use a raw conversion software like the one supplied by your camera manufacturer to convert those raw files into something that Lightroom can recognize. Just keep this in mind anytime you upgrade your camera that you might not be able to immediately edit those files. So you might have heard the terms destructive and non-destructive editing before. What exactly do those mean? Well, in a nutshell, it refers to how your editing software affects the original image file. Non-destructive editing software doesn't touch or affect your original image file, whereas destructive software can potentially affect and change your original image file. To give you a few examples, the most popular non-destructive photo editing software out there is Adobe Lightroom. Now in Lightroom, it doesn't matter if you edit a RAW file, JPEG, TIFF, anything like that, nothing is going to change on your original image file. Everything is written to a catalog within Lightroom's database and no changes are directly written to the image file itself. On the other hand, Adobe Photoshop is an example of destructive editing software. Now what this means is if you open up a JPEG or a TIFF file in Photoshop and you make some edits and press save, it's going to overwrite the original image file. So at this point you might be saying, hey, as long as I shoot in RAW, I can do anything I want. Any mistakes I make, I'll just fix them while I'm editing my photos. Well, that's not entirely the case. There are limitations to what your editing software can do, and we wanna talk about a few of those right now. So let's say you completely get the exposure wrong in your image. There is no way that you can recover information that just isn't there. And if you completely overexpose your image, you're losing lots of the highlighted areas. Take a look at this image, for example you can see it's completely overexposed and when we try and recover it, even though lots of the scene looks just fine, there's parts of the image that are entirely missing and there is no way that you can get that back in post-processing software. Another thing that you can't fix while you're editing your photos is a blurry image. Now it doesn't matter if your camera wasn't focused, if your subject was moving, or if your camera was shaking, a blurry image is impossible to fix in post-processing software. Next, with most cameras out there, it's impossible to change which part of the image is in focus with post-processing software. Another thing you can't do is increase the depth of field of your image. So for example, if you shoot a photograph and your subject is in focus, but the background is not in focus because you have a very shallow depth of field, you can't increase the depth of field and make the background sharper. 
Now, one more thing that you can't do in post-processing software is change the focal length of the lens that you use to take a photo. So for example, if you use a telephoto lens and you take a very tight photo of a person and you get back and you're editing your photos and you say, well, I want more background there. You can't just go and say wide angle option and suddenly there's more background available. That information was never captured. It's not available to you in post-processing software. On the other hand, you can shoot a wide lens and say, I want to crop in tighter and simulate the effect of a tighter focal length, maybe a telephoto lens. But at the same time you do that, you're losing lots of information and potentially could end up with a very small image. So with that, you can't change your focal length in post-processing. Make sure you choose the right one when you're out shooting. Now you've all seen TV shows like CSI where they enhance photos and, and really zoom in and, and see people's faces or license plates in a very blurry photo. Well, is that something that's possible in post-processing software? I don't know, let's give it a try. So we've got this image here, it's a beautiful mountain. Oh man, I love this scene, it's just so peaceful, but wait, what is that over there in the bushes? Let's zoom in, enhance, zoom in, enhance. Zoom in, ah, whoa, hey, that's scary. That's, that's John Sherman in the bushes on that mountain. Well, that's why you never want to zoom in too much. You just never know what's hiding in those bushes. So now that we've talked about what you can't do while you're editing photos, let's talk a little bit about what you can do. And I wanna start out by saying that anytime you shoot in RAW, those images should not be considered finished until you've taken them into editing software and spent a little bit of time working on them. So just to give you an idea of what's possible, most post-processing software will be able to do basic adjustments like cropping, exposure adjustment, white balance changes, and even some highlight and shadow recovery. There's also more advanced adjustments that you can make such as noise reduction, sharpening, and even adjusting specific colors. And more advanced software will even let you do things like create panoramas, HDRs, apply lens corrections, and use brushes to edit just particular parts of your images. Now these are just a few examples of what software like Lightroom can do for you. And if you choose to use software like Photoshop, the options basically become limitless. There is so much more that Photoshop can do compared to Lightroom, we couldn't even begin to scratch the surface. So keep in mind, we're just trying to give you an idea of what these programs are capable of. In an upcoming section, we're gonna go into a lot more detail with specific programs and go over almost all of the different editing options available.